Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Vosco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about, well, the best wine show anywhere. All right, this is part two, part two, part dos of a six part series of on Chilean Carmenere, like all the wines in the series. Uh, this is a free sample and I have free reign to review it however I wish. Way back in episode 99 of the WWTV area, that the current one we're in right now, uh, I did a detailed segment on Chilean wine. Nothing has really changed from that. So if you want to know more, then hit the link in the description and watch the first seven minutes or so. That episode's links also include a ton of resources. All right, today's wine comes from Invina. No tilde over the end, so, uh, so not sure if it's Vina or Vina, um, but anyway, somewhat of a newer player in the Chilean wine industry, the Huber family came to Chile in 1999. So digging into their website and everyone's bios, the Huber family is from the U.S. and is headed by Richard Huber. Uh, Richard comes from the financial world, having worked all over the world for major institutions. His bio states that he found a love for wine in tapas early in his life. He had taken a break from his chemistry studies at Harvard, all right, and went to Spain. Later on, as in uh, to financial world life, he was perplexed at the prices his colleagues were paying for wine. It was like he felt like it didn't live up to the quality. Uh, this formed his philosophy that a wine's value should be based on its quality, not the specific place or how much of it is made. Essentially, scarcity doesn't necessarily equate to price. Feel free to watch my other episode linked uh, below about why wine costs what it does. Okay, Richard, we'll see how that stands up today. I like this concept, but we all know that supply and demand do factor in all commerce. Also, a wine's final cost is related to many things, including the location, but not because of some magical aura over the vineyard, maybe, or winery, but mostly due to the value of the land and or the property taxes, which in many cases, a vineyard is considered farmland and property taxes on farmland, at least in the United States for the most part, isn't really high compared to say just your house. Uh, anyway, plus dozens of other things that influence the cost of wine, just like any other product. The overarching point is that we wanted to make, that he wanted to make a wine that is affordable. Anyway, in 1999, he invested in a Chilean vineyard project. There are three other family members, Alex, uh, who's listed as a founder and CEO, Benjamin, listed as a partner, and Catherine, listed as a partner. Alex is listed as Richard's son. Uh, the other two aren't specifically mentioned as Richard's son and daughter. Benjamin almost certainly is. Catherine may be Richard's daughter, uh, probably his daughter. I, I don't think she's married to either one of them. Um, I'm really almost positive she's, she's Richard's daughter. Uh, anyway, Alex worked as a management consultant in Brazil and also served for five years for the United Nations peacekeeping operations in Cambodia, Mozambique, and Guatemala. He's the driving force for the company. In 2001, he joined his father in Chile to be the CFO of the project. Eventually, they formed Invina in 2007 solely to grow grapes. Five years later, however, in 2012, they decided to build a winery. Benjamin is another financial sector person, having worked for several different companies in the U.S., Brazil, Chile, England, and Japan. It appears he is currently a land and assets investor. Catherine seems to have a, had a small role early on, but is now focused on ceramics. Invina has eight lines of wines. Uh, we are focused on the Luma Chikuan line today. I probably butchered that. Uh, about all I can find out is this uh, quote from their website. Quote, Luma offers handmade wines selected from the best lots of Invina's extensive vineyards, fermented in small tanks, then aged in barrel for 12 months. End quote. All right, they have four different wines. All are at a Grand Reserva level.
And I'm pretty sure the same thing for Argentina, but somewhere in the back of my head, I feel like somewhere someone told me, no, there are legal definitions, but I don't remember finding it in, finding it in a legal document. If it's there, cool, let me know. And, um, I'll, I'll make sure I, I'll make sure I don't make that mistake again. Okay. And with that, let's get the stats for this wine. This is the 2020 Invina Luma Shaken Carmenere Grand Reserva. St uh, suggested retail price, $17. It's from the Valle de Mole. The vineyards are Batuco, Las Tizas, and Buena Vista. 100% Carmenere. Harvest. Manual, uh, manual harvest in 10 kilogram baskets. In other words, they're small baskets. Fermentation, stainless steel. Maceration, five days. Aging, 12 months in barrel. No mention of type of barrel or new or used. ABV is 13.9%. Aging potential, 10 years, though best in two to three years. Something to make note of, uh, the vineyards are in two sub-appellations of the Malay Valley, uh, Penichue and Batuco. Uh, so Penichue for Batuco and Las Tizas, and then San Rafael for Buena Vista. Also, to break my arm, patting myself on the back, it took me a couple hours, but I'm pretty sure I nailed the locations of all of Invina's vineyards. Okay, so Buena Vista was easy since that's where the winery is located, but the others uh, were a bit of a challenge. But once I found the first one, the rest came pretty quickly. And that's, and that's as I kind of knew what to look for. Let's get into the wine. So kind of a trick I, 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 that seems to work when I'm looking for these vineyards, uh, wineries tend to farm their grapes in similar fashions. So when you're looking from the air, and also when you're looking on the ground, when you're looking at the, the vineyards, you will see kind of, it's kind of, hard to, kind of hard to explain, but you'll see how the, how the vines are arranged and you'll see like the distance between the vines, you'll see like the paths and everything, or the, the, or the little dirt paths around the vineyards. They all tend to be the same across wineries. But when you look from above, you'll see like one set of paths might be a different uh, look to them, maybe a different width or whatever, compared to the, the one next to it. So that's why um, a lot of times you can kind of go, well, this, if you see one winery's vineyard and how it's created, and you look at another one miles away, you're like, well, oh, this, obviously it's theirs. So in some ways it's kind of, once you know how one should look, you know how all will tend to look. All right, let's go ahead and check it out. Again, color's good. Um, so this is four years old because it was harvested four years old, four years ago. And there is a tinge of orange since I don't since I don't deal with Carmenere very often especially Carmenere that has anything more than like a year or two of age um, I don't know if it's a wine that can oxidize quickly so the ones that do that for me uh, in general are Sangiovese and Tempranillo they tend to become orange like within like a couple like by four years you can start seeing um like definite orange this is more like it kind of just looks a little more i hate to use the word brickish but um there's a different color of red we'll put it that way but it's nice and deep not deep but it's you know decent color it's it's a god called medium plus on that it's not completely opaque all right hello carmen air oh wow yeah okay so the first the first appearance of actual like i smell pepper like a little, little bell pepper, green bell pepper. Yeah, and it's like, it's like all the peppers, it's like peppers and sausage. It's like the yellow and the red and the green all combined in one. They were, they were cooked and roasted. Um, there's a little bit of smokiness to it. Um, you got that red fruit, got that raspberry. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, it's like, it's like roasted. It's like roasted bell pepper. I'm digging that. Now it's a bit elevated, like it's kind of the thing you smell the most or I smell the most. Um, the red fruit is more muted. I do get some earthiness to it, some forest floor. But yeah, it's like almost like peppers and onions too, like, like the caramelized onions a little bit. That can, you don't really want onion in a wine, um, but it kind of reminds me of peppers and onions and fajitas. Um, 
or when dad makes goulash, the American Hungarian version, um, you know, you've got, you've got that, that kind of ground meat and the peppers in there. They don't use, we don't use cumin. I don't believe in, in it. We might I'll have to double check that. We put paprika in it because, well, that's what you're supposed to do. But yeah, I'm loving the smell of this. Like this is one of those where I could probably smell for a little while and it'd be great. I will make, make a mention 17 bucks, right? This looks expensive, right? This looks like a $25, $30 bottle of wine. That little like look like that I had. Well, okay. I, I made these little gestures and, and looks when I'm, when I'm doing this stuff, but I kind of forget that you're seeing it all sped up so much that you may not catch it. But I had this little like kind of look like that. Um, I don't know why, but it just made me think of fish sauce, like something ocean like. It wasn't bad. It just was like, huh? What's that? With that said, it's gone. Again, you know, mouth is palate adjusting to a, to a new wine. So there might be something that was just a little bit kind of unusual, but spicy red fruit, uh, raspberry, uh, cranberry. Um, you have bell green bell pepper and jalapeno in there. Um, it's still roasted, not as roasted on the palate as it is on the nose. You can, whoo, feels warm. What are we at? Are we at 14? Yeah, 13, nine. Um, yeah, it's definitely more alcoholic than, than the last one. What was the last one? At least on the on the palate feels more. Yeah, this last one was thirteen, so uh, a definite you know a definite difference, and not in a bad way. Just like oh, hello, you come you come to the party. Ah, this wine smells so good. There is a bit of enchilada going on here too, just more like fajitas, not necessarily enchiladas, more like fajitas, or like spicy barbecue. Wow, I mean this would be, and this is a this is a great meat wine. Like spicy sausage, you know, um, fajitas, uh, barbecue, especially if you have like a little bit of a spicy, smoky uh, barbecue sauce or like, you know, the brisket like has a good, has a good bark on it. Yeah. Or, or ribs. It's kind of a, a lighter feeling wine. Um, it's really medium body. It comes a little bit across like, like spicy Pinot Noir. Whereas the last one was a little bit heavier on the body. Um, this one kind of tastes really um, lighter. Now, the first one, I did say I talked about juicy. I think what I was trying to explain was that it didn't feel like it was really overwhelming as far as body. It was lighter, but this is lighter. Um, it's super refreshing. If you like, well, of course, I should chill all these. But if you get this like a little bit of a chill and had barbecue with it, holy crimony. This would be, this would be fantastic. Yeah. I'm gonna drink a little bit of that. This is really good stuff. I'm very, very, very pleased with that. I cannot wait to crush that bottle at some point. All right, so that's gonna do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and then tell your friends. We'll see you next time, again, with more Chilean Carbonara.